Folks, to this our latest Cutmere Hill Church Service at Home, can I offer you the warmest of welcomes. Whatever your week has been like, whether it has been good or bad, I hope that for this short time you'll be able to pause, to stop, uh, to come before God in worship and in prayer. Uh, my hope is that as we come to God's word, as we read of his character, as we pray together in our homes, that we grow more in our affection and adoration for Christ. Uh, a few notices just before we begin. Uh, we're continuing to send it to Pastoral Care List, although there will be a break uh, in that this week. But, uh, I'm actually going to be taking it a week off um, as of tomorrow. Um, but if there's anything you'd like the church to be praying for, um, please do be in touch so that I can add it into that Pastoral Care List. Um, or if you'd like to receive that pastoral care list and your name isn't already on the list of those receiving that, uh, please let me know and I'll get that over to you. Uh, one of the things I mentioned last week and appeared on our Facebook last week as well um, was our upcoming Alpha course which starts on the 18th of March. Uh, it might be that you're wondering uh, what that course will be like before you, uh, you want some more information before you sign up for that. Uh, I, and if that's um, the case, then um, let's, we're going to watch a short video uh, to hopefully whet your appetite uh, and start thinking uh, about coming along and joining us uh, as we explore Alpha. So let's um, see that trailer now. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. My girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible, but the truth is none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. So that gives you a, a taste, of, hopefully, of, of what the Alpha course is going to be like um, when we begin on the 18th of March. So uh, if you'd like to sign up for that, or uh, even if you've still got some more questions, um, uh, you're still wondering what it's all about, uh, please do uh, get in touch and send me an email and I'll, I'll try my hardest uh, to answer those questions for you. Uh, even if you've been part of Kirkby Hill Church for as long as you can remember and are keen to explore what it means to follow Jesus in this season, uh, why not join us? Why not come uh, and, and, and hear and answer some of those big questions? Who is Jesus? Uh, why, is, why does he matter? What, is it, what does it mean to pray? What, is, 
what is the church about and come and explore those questions with us at Alpha uh, starting on the 18th of March. Um, and, and please do uh, get in touch if that's something you'd like to be part of just so I can make sure I've got the uh, I've got your information so I can send you the details for that course starter. Uh, we come this morning to worship uh, and we do so uh, by first of all praying together. So let's um, come before God in prayer. Uh, Lord God, we come this morning to acknowledge that the strength for our souls isn't found in our own guile and determination. It's not found in thinking that if we just keep going, maybe it'll all begin to make sense. But rather it's found in your love. The love that created the world we see around us. The love poured out on your people over and over again. Love made manifest when it moved into the neighbourhood. The love that we find coming into this world with every Christmas that we celebrate. The love that would go to the cross that we might be forgiven for every sin that clings so closely. The love that was risen from the grave. The love that was sent with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The love that remains even today. It's that love that brings life to our souls. It is that love that is our strength. It's that love that affords us with a bright hope for tomorrow, no matter what it might bring. It is a hope that is sure and steadfast, a hope that clings on even in the hardest of circumstance, because it is a hope found in you. As we come this morning, we know that our joy is found only in your presence. So as we come this morning, would you once again lift our eyes away from the world around us, away from the mess that so often distracts our attention, and turn our eyes to you, Lord, to solely on you, that we might know once again that unrelenting love, the hope that comes from knowing your joyful presence in our lives. We come this morning to open your word because it is your word that leads and guides our lives. So often we try and remain in the driving seat uh, with your word somewhere in the back. Uh, so Lord, our prayer for this morning is that you might reorientate our priorities once more. Would your word be a lamp to our feet? Our, your word our leading and guiding and Lord would your word be in the driving seat of our lives not simply there as a passenger but controlling and changing our lives from the inside out and because we come this morning knowing that your ways are higher than ours we don't always understand what you're asking of us but yet the invitation remains to follow. And with the invitation to follow you, you're, you're calling us to trust. And Lord, as we take that walk with you, as we follow you, as we trust you more, our earthly cares and considerations find themselves lessening and lessening. We find that our trust in you grows more and more. And so this morning, would you help us to echo the words of Joshua? And be able to say that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, not seek to serve ourselves, not seek to serve our own um, goals, our own wills, but rather we would seek to serve you. That you would be at the heart of our homes, whatever that might take. And that you would be the one that we look to. And as we do, we find that you look upon us not with a frown but a smile. Because we come to know your love. So we come to know that we might know you more. And that we would then be able to sing of your love forever. All this we ask in the beautiful name of Jesus. Who first taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. You know, we sing for the first time this morning a hymn that's also a prayer that God would speak to us as we come to him in worship. As we sing together, speak, O Lord. Uh, and after we have sung, Shirley is going to read for us for this morning from Mark chapter 13 and verses 14. To 19. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food. Mark chapter 13 verses 14 to 19. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roofs of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the fields 
go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequal from the beginning when God created the world, until now and never to be equaled again. Uh, thank you for doing that, Shirley. I really appreciate it. If anyone else uh, would like to read going forward, uh, then I'd love to hear from you. So please do be in touch. Um, I, I think one of the things that comes in, in life, no matter what stage of life you're at, uh, is the fact that just around daily, uh, you're met with different warnings um, about different things. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you're someone who drives, then um, the, the lights on the car dash might start to flash and um, that something is wrong and he's looked at as soon as possible. Uh, sometimes those lights are simply warnings. Um, when, when the car skids uh, and the light comes on to tell you that the car has, is now skidding, <laughs> um, not as if you didn't know it was. Uh, or when the service light comes on to tell you that actually your car now needs a bit of attention. Um, but these kind of flashing lights, flashing warnings, we, we see them all around us. Uh, you might have seen them on Carlisle Road um, with the uh, lights flash when um, the speed limit goes to a 20 because you're in a school zone. And um, we know that flashing lights uh, on a traffic crossing, um, uh, so when it goes from uh, red to amber, amber doesn't mean um, off you go, it means get ready because there still uh, it could be people crossing the road at that point. Uh, and so actually what you find is that we're often met with um, warning signs, warning bells uh, that tell us when something's happening. Uh, so you, you see this most regularly when you're out on the road. Um, when uh, you come to cross the road at, uh, at traffic lights, um, you will actually not only see the green man, but you'll also hear the beeping noise, which tells you it's safe to cross. Uh, and and um, you also see different kinds of crossings with different lights attached to it, so that people know uh, to slow down and, and to know um, that, this mat and, uh, that there's something happening uh, there. Uh, and we see this all the time, um, all these different lights and warnings. Um, and they're also then, uh, you find them around the home. Um, for example, how many of us have um, heard that insistent beeping noise uh, that comes when your smoke alarm is running low on battery? Um, I imagine most of it. Uh, it's one of the most frustrating noises, just that kind of constant beep um, that makes you know that you have to actually do something about it. Uh, and if you don't change the batteries, all you're ever going to get is just that constant beep that the batteries are dying. Uh, sometimes if you've left something on in, in the, uh, on the cooker or in the oven and uh, you've forgotten all about it, the smoke detector uh, will actually go off um, and tell you that something is now burning. And over and over again in the world that we live in, we are met with these different alarms, different warnings, different lights uh, that come on to tell us that something isn't quite right. I wonder when enough is enough. How many times when you ignore the light that's come on in the dashboard before you get it seen to? How many times will you ignore the smoke alarm until it's not just something that you've burned you had to face, but rather it's something that was burning and is now on fire? When does a warning reach such a level that it's time to take action? When is the alarm so loud and unavoidable that it's best to actually deal with it? When is the time to get out and to seek help? What we find in our passage for this morning follows on from what we were looking at last week when Jesus begins to tell the disciples what to expect, what they might hear in terms of warning signs. And this week, he goes on to tell them what they're to do when they see the end coming. Uh, last week, if you joined us, we were faced with a diagnosis from Jesus uh, about the kind of world that the disciples would have to live in. Uh, and we noted that it's a passage first and foremost for the 12 disciples uh, that we've met whilst reading Mark's Gospel and for all the followers of Jesus. Um, but it's also a world that those after, who come after those will have to live in as well. Uh, and so we found that often disciples are impressed with their own kind of things. Uh, we looked at the stones the disciples call magnificent. Jesus tells them those stones are just stones. And actually goes on to warn them 
that they will not stand the test of time. And I mean, we, we saw that often we too can be, become impressed with the wrong kind of things. And Jesus calls us instead to fix our eyes on him. And we found that the world that, we, that they faced would be a world of frightening things. Wars, rumours of wars. And we saw that even we have to face the fact that our world remains, well actually rather similar. And we, we looked at the fact that the world will be a deceitful place for the disciples that many will come and say that they are the Christ they have come to save. And Jesus tells them and us to be on our guard against that. And that as followers of Jesus, we'll face persecution. We're, we're told to expect it. Now we, we notice that actually our persecution is often that we'll be laughed at, mocked and ridiculed. Um, and for others around the world, that actually it's, it's a much worse fate. Um, it, it could mean imprisonment, it could even mean death. Uh, but we, we, we looked at the fact that every follower of Jesus will be persecuted in some way. And not only that, um, we were also told that we'll be hated because of Jesus, because of following him. And if you go through all that last week, um, you might have been forgiven for thinking, but well, what on earth is good about this? What on earth is good about following Jesus? Where's the joy? Where's the fullness of life that Andrew talks about week after week? Where's that in this? We saw that in our passage last week too. We saw that there's this idea that even in the midst of wars and rumours of wars, the end is not yet. That Jesus calls them the birth pains. And it tells us that something better is coming. And that there's still a task that is unfinished. Because the gospel has yet to reach all nations. And we looked at that 1040 window last week. And, and actually we saw that the Holy Spirit is still powerful and is active in our lives. And so you might be forgiven for having come to the end of that list of, of being impressed with wrong things, a frightening world, a deceitful world, a persecuting world, and a hating world, and think, well, what's the point? This is the point. The hope is the point. And yet what we're going to find this week is that before it gets better, it gets a whole lot worse. So let's delve into this passage in some more detail. And first of all, in verses 14 to 17, when it all goes wrong. Maybe it's just me. But I tend to remember times when it all went wrong rather than times when it all went well. Maybe it's just me. One of my most memorable moments when I was preaching during my training um, was, was trying to encourage a group of young people to come up and catch a bubble. And they all flat out refused. Even when I said if they did and could catch one, I'd give them a £5 note. I even, I even took the £5 note out of my pocket and held it up to so they could see um, that there was a £5 on offer, uh, if you can catch a bubble, I'll give you this. Still, they flat out refused. Why? Well, as one of the young people shouted out, you can't catch a bubble, it'll burst. <laughs> uh, they were right. Uh, actually, that same young person came to me at the end of the service after they'd completely soaked up their hands and said, right, blow the bubble now because I can catch it. Um, they did, they got a five pound and uh, I still didn't get to make the point I was looking to make. Uh, and actually since that moment, I've never tried that again. Uh, but we often remember when things didn't go well. You know, I could tell you numbers of stories where things like that happened. I, I, I struggle to tell you when things went well. Because we are wired to remember the things that don't go well. Do you know, we, we remember the disasters we've had to face. 
We remember the times where everything changed. We remember the times when everything went wrong. And you see it in every sphere in life. I imagine that you can remember a past feeling better than you can remember a past success. And that might be in the home, it might be in your working life. But we all tend to remember when things didn't go well, rather than when they did. Somehow it's the way we're wired. But you also see this kind of attitude in sport. With replays being discussed over and over again, about how something was approached or how something had happened. Uh, you might look at past mistakes of different teams, uh, some mistakes made long before the current crop of players were ever playing. Uh, mistakes are poured over though. Mistakes that have been made are poured over more than successes. Uh, and I think the reason that we do that, the reason that we pour over mistakes, whether they're in their own life or whether uh, it's in something else completely different and discussing your favourite sports team, uh, is because we want to try and learn from the mistakes that we've made. And we want to learn and not repeat them. Uh, what we're finding in these opening verses uh, is that Jesus wants to remind the disciples that history has a way of repeating itself. Uh, there's a reason that the, the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about the fact there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and, 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 and to a certain extent, he's right. Uh, we, we will constantly see history repeating itself. But what Jesus does is different from how society often treats that, because society uh, would look at that and say history is always repeating itself, and, and, and we would talk about why. Jesus actually says, history will repeat itself, but let me help you in that. Let me help you when that happens. Uh, let me give you something else to focus your mind on, something else to consider when all of that is going on. Uh, so first of all, in verse 14, um, we find the, the mention of this idea of an abomination that causes desolation. Uh, uh, what commentators refer to as the abomination of desolation. Now, when you read that, you're probably wondering, what on earth is Jesus talking about? Uh, because if we're honest, it doesn't sound as though it's going to be an encouragement, does it? You know, as soon as you hear those words, abomination and desolation, you're, you're not immediately thinking, smiles, rainbows and happiness. Uh, you're thinking, oh man, what's coming? <laughs> and actually, you'd be spot on. You know, this, this isn't written as an encouragement. Um, if you've got a Bible open in front of you, and I hope you do, uh, it may be that actually when you look at that verse you'll see a, a letter and beside that idea of the abomination that causes desolation, it's, in, it's normally in quotation marks depending on what version you're using, um, but you'll see a, a letter and the letter will, um, if you look down below, depending on what you're using, if you're using a, a phone or a tablet it's probably just a case of click on it, but if you're using a, a paper Bible, the, down below it will give you where that cross reference takes you. And actually, uh, it takes you to the book of Daniel. Um, now, Daniel is someone we know, and we know Daniel's story. Uh, do you know that idea in, uh, we find in chapter 1 where he's taken into exile uh, with his friends, and um, he and his friends only eat vegetables, and uh, they look healthier than those that have eaten the, the best goods from the king's table. Um, he and his friends are then thrown into the fiery furnace, um, but, but they're saved by the appearance of what is, looks like a fourth man. Um, and, uh, Daniel's wisdom is God-given and it, it raises him up um, in the eyes of the ruler. Um, others are jealous and try to trip Daniel up by making uh, prayer illegal. Uh, Daniel completely ignores that and um, prays um, as he was always doing. He doesn't change. Uh, and they go to the king and say, King, um, may you live forever, but look what Daniel's done. And, and the king says, well, what can I do but throw him into the lion's den? And, 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 and Daniel comes out unscathed from that. Uh, so that's, that's Daniel. And in fact, that's the first six chapters of Daniel, pretty much in a really condensed version uh, with a lot of detail missed out. But I mean, that's the Daniel that we know. Uh, in fact, that's, that's generally from what the book of Daniel we know. Uh, but the Daniel we don't know 
is what happens next in the book because we normally stop at chapter 6 after Daniel has come out of the lion's den. That's normally where we stop Daniel's story. And the reason for that is because the rest of Daniel, six more chapters, are, are all manner of visions about what is yet to come. And, and actually, the reason that we often don't look at them, and, and I can say this because we didn't when, when I preached to Daniel, is because those six chapters are so mind-boggling that we're not really sure how to approach them. Uh, commentators disagree all the time on them about what that means and what that was and what that looked like. Uh, and actually what you find in, in those six, six chapters in Daniel is that if the Israelites thought it was bad being in Babylon, uh, it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, and Daniel has these visions of, of what the future will look like. Um, and one of these visions about, is about this abomination that causes desolation. Uh, so most commentators agree um, that actually this abomination of desolation is referring uh, to one specific person who comes after Daniel. Uh, and his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in, in, in 167-168 BC um, sets up an altar to other gods right in the heart of the temple. The idea of desolation is about that. Idolatry has taken place. The temple has been desecrated. And, and so that's that's what this is referring back to. And Jesus, is, in, in this passage, he is almost looking back to an event um, that so shocked the Jewish people, uh, that caused them to weep and to wail, and, and actually was a, a defining moment for them. But we're now somewhere about 200 years after those events. The temple's still standing. So what on earth is Jesus talking about here? Uh, and, 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 uh, and if the temple is still standing, then obviously that event, it wasn't enough to get rid of the temple. Well, not for much longer, says Jesus. He's looking ahead to when again the temple will be faced with an abomination of desolation. Although this time it will not just be marked by pagan worship, it will be the destruction of the temple. Which in itself links back to verse 1. When the disciples are so impressed with these magnificent stones, soon it will be rubble. It's going to happen about AD 70. And so what the disciples are being told is that it's, it's not likely to happen in their lifetime, mainly because of the number of disciples who die um, in, in the early church. Um, but the disciples who come after them, uh, the next generation, will see the temple destroyed. And so what are they to do? And we'll notice that this um, isn't just something that they're going to hear. And there's almost, there's almost a sense, actually, when we move from last week's passage, when they're hearing war, about wars and rumours of wars, and it's almost abstract. It's, it's out there. And then, and then the, this kind of level of seriousness um, rises when you get to these verses. Because not only is it now just being heard of, but they're going to see this. You know, sometimes when, when we watch the news um, and hear of, of horrific circumstances happening in our places... Uh, it, 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 we're, we're almost immune to it because actually it just sits off and it's, it's not our country. Uh, but when it happens to us and we see it, well, that's when, that's when we realise just how bad it's got. Uh, think about the, the beasts in the East. <laughs> uh, that was a few years ago where, where supermarkets ran out of bread on shelves. You know, that's the, um, we, we, it's, it's, it was hard to hear about that it felt worse to see it. And so what you're seeing is actually the, that kind of um, level of, of how bad this is going to get. It rises from when we look, the passage we looked at last week to the passage we're in now. Because not only is it now just heard about, they're going to see this with their own eyes. And, and, and the, the command that they're given then when they see this is to flee to the mountains. Notice the urgency that's in that. Do you know this isn't just a, uh, take your time, you've got about a week to get away. This is flee, run, make haste as fast as you can. 
when the end comes and it will come, they're to run. And in verses 15 and 16, they're told not to look back. And the idea of going down from the housetop it comes from the ways in which houses were built at that time. And because every house normally had a flat roof. And, and we looked at that with, with the story of the paralysed man, because if the roof's not flat, and how on earth do you actually manage to dig a hole in it uh, and lower a man through it if it's not a flat roof? And uh, so what you'd find is that people would spend time on the roofs of their homes, uh, and especially in good weather, they would often actually spend time um, in that, uh, at the top of the house, on, on top of the roof. Uh, some would even sleep there. Uh, and yet what they're told in this passage is that um, they're, they're not to uh, go back down into the house and try and grab things. As soon as, as, soon as they see this happening, they're to run. <laughs> Same if they find themselves out working in the fields and they've taken their cloak off, they're not to go back for it. They're to run as fast as they can away from what they see happening. In, verses, in verse 17, we find that Jesus goes on to talk about uh, those who are pregnant or nursing, how dreadful it will be for them. Now, that's not Jesus saying that it's awful to be pregnant or it's awful to be a, a nursing mum at that time. It's because it's harder to run with children in tow. Remember the last time you flew? And when you were told during that safety briefing that none of us would ever really listened to and that you have to make sure that you've got your own oxygen mask fitted before helping the child next to you? I often wonder, who pays attention to that? I don't think there's any parent that I know that would pay attention to that. You know, as soon as that oxygen mask drops, then the first thing they want to do is put the mask on the child. Then they'll worry about themselves. And what you find in that is that those who are parents always look out for their children. That's, that's what you do. And, and I think what Jesus is saying is he knows that. So I acknowledge how difficult it's going to be for them. And yeah, when it, when it comes, when the destruction is being seen, they are to flee and not dawdle. They are to make haste and flee to the mountains. To get away as soon as they can and also as far as they can. So what then happens in the rest of the passage? Does it get better? Uh, verses 18 and 19, the days of distress. And I suppose it's, it's, it's quite likely that we actually don't have that much time left in, in Mark's Gospel. Uh, some of you might be delighted to hear me say that. Others um, might be a bit kind of taken aback because this is a book that we've, that we've walked through since um, September of 2019. Um, but we, and we still have about 14 weeks left in this. Uh, but kind of going by that and, and taking some time off around about Easter to look at the Easter story afresh uh, for, and also to look at Holy Week, uh, we're, we're probably going to be in this up until about summer time. Whether that's online or in person, uh, and we'll see what comes over the next few months. But we'll be, we'll be finished Mark's Gospel um, by some point in the summer. Uh, but for me, chapter 13 has been the most difficult chapter to get my head around. It's so unlike anything that's gone before. And when we get to chapter 14 to 16, it's us moving towards uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Do you know, it's moving into passages that we're actually quite familiar with. Chapter 13's not like that. It's not like reading a parable. It's not reading an encounter that Jesus has with someone. It's not even reading about Jesus performing a miracle uh, of feeding or healing or, or, or walking on water of the miracles we know and love um, of Jesus. In fact, uh, Mark chapter 13 is not generally a passage many people are preaching on, as I've found uh, in these last few weeks when I've been looking for help and comment on them. It's a hard passage to get to grips with. And it's why we've been taking it so slowly. In fact, most commentaries uh, have a few pages and they take the whole uh, of Mark chapter 13 in those few pages. Chapter 13 has caused great debate. Was it only written for the disciples then? Was it written for the disciples in the future? 
Uh, what's actually in mind here? Big questions when it comes to this chapter. And my argument, as, as you've probably heard over these last few weeks, is that it's both. Because on one hand, it's about something that's coming fairly soon. That abomination of desol- that causes desolation. And you see it happen uh, when the temple is destroyed in AD 70. And, but there are likely events that are coming uh, that, that give warrant to the fact that this is also something that's coming in the future. I, and actually, I, we're going to see that in a few weeks' time when we, when we come back into Mark chapter 13. Um, that, that this is not just about um, an immediate future that's coming um, in the next generation, but actually it's also about what's coming at the very end of the world. Because while this is bad, and not something that will, will fill um, with great joy, it doesn't finish here. It's why we could relate to the passage last week when we're given that diagnosis about the world because we still know it to be the case. You know, the the Bible's truth, it never changes. It was true then and it continues to be true now. Uh, So in verse 18 we find that Jesus tells um, the disciples to pray that that what he's telling them will come to pass doesn't come in winter. Again, it relates back to what we saw about this idea of women being pregnant or nursing. Um, it's about the conditions. You know, it's, it's easier to um, it's easier to go for a run <laughs> uh, when the weather's nice. It's not quite as nice to go for a run in the middle of winter. You know, it's just about conditions. Winter would have been harder and harsher. It's harder uh, to have enough food because you can't grow as much. Uh, so the idea is um, it's, it's going to be harder for them if that happens at winter time. In uh, verse 19 that we're told that Jesus foresees this as the day of great distress. It be unlike anything they've seen before. Uh, you know, you, you, they probably heard the stories of Antiochus Epiphanes of what he'd done because that's how the Jewish religion worked. It worked on telling stories to generations and generations. They probably thought that was as bad as it was going to get. Jesus says something's coming that is much worse. It's good. And nothing will be equal to them. Now, and we look at this passage and what well, we find that while well, the temple's been destroyed, you know, surely that was a warning for the followers of Jesus then of how bad it was going to get. But, but for us now where we are, that temple's gone, it's been destroyed. We don't have to worry about that. And you're right to an extent. We don't have to worry about this. We don't have to worry about the temple being destroyed because that's already happened. But if you find yourselves... Um, I, for spare five minutes this afternoon, take a look at Mark 13 and verses 20 to 27. Because what you're going to find there is that even though the temple is in the rearview mirror, there's something creeping ever closer on the horizon that will eclipse the destruction of the temple. But that's for another week. So with the temple being destroyed, with people fleeing, with the whole scene just making us feel this sense of unease, and everything seemingly thrust into chaos. What do we cling to for hope? If I was to ask you how you're feeling right now, I wonder how you'd answer. And actually, I don't even have to wonder how you answer. I, I probably know how you'd answer. Because it's a question I ask people when I meet them. How are you, how are you doing at the moment? I, I ask that of uh, people who are working, people who are retired. I, I, I ask it of young people. <laughs> and they all give me the same answer. I'm fine. And then what they do is really interesting because that's the answer that we give. Um, but they then ask me, well, how are you doing? And I've had this when I've been phoning people, when I've met people in the street. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. What about you, Andrew? Normally followed closely by how stiff. Um, and that's what happens in most conversations I've had. 
And actually, if the, the shoe was on the other foot uh, and you were to ask me how I'm doing, I'd tell you I'm doing fine. How are you? How's the family? But if we took time to dig a bit under that defensive answer of I'm fine, that we're almost conditioned to give at the moment, and I actually said to you, but how are you doing? How would you answer the question? If I was to ask you, how are you feeling? I hope you'd be a bit more honest with me. And maybe I'm doing fine, that's great. How are you feeling? Tired? Frustrated? Overwhelmed? Anxious? Bored? Plain fed up? Thing for each one of us, there have been those feelings at different times over and over and over again, especially in this past year. We've all been through the ringer. And I, I think sometimes we come on Sundays looking for some comfort about from God's Word, looking for God to speak to us once more, to fill us with hope, to see ahead the week, to make it through that week that's coming. Even if we're not sure everything will happen. And we're looking for God to comfort and for God to guide. And yet we come to Mark 13 this week and there's a passage all about destruction. I don't even know how many of you have actually even got to this point in the service. I don't know how many of you heard the reading and thought, actually, I just can't face that this morning. And yet, let me say this. I found this passage profoundly helpful this past week. Because I think there's something in here that actually helps to keep going, or helps me to keep going. It should help us to keep going. Because the temptation just now is just to throw in the towel. Throw in the towel when we're faced with chaos. Now, it's not the same chaos that faced those in Judea when the temple was being destroyed and far from it. But I think the truth of what they're called to still rings true. Notice in verse 18 they're called to pray this doesn't happen in winter. Now, we've glossed over that verse a little bit and part of the reason is because I was coming back to it here. Because when we're faced with chaos... We often don't pray. When we're faced with situations that are out with our control, we often don't pray. When we're faced with what feels like a wall that is insurmountable, we often don't pray. When the people of Judea are told to flee when they see the coming of this abomination that causes desolation, they're told... First of all, to flee, but they're called to prayer. Pray this doesn't happen in winter. Even in the face of what's happening all around them, they're still called to pray. Now, it's a, it's a very specific prayer. Pray this doesn't happen in winter. But actually, even with this impending chaos and everything that's to come, Jesus still calls them to pray. And not to lose sight of them. But they're also reminded of whose world we're a part of. In verse 19, Jesus tells us when God created the world. You know, it may seem like a throwaway line, but it gives me confidence. It gives me hope that even though I've tried to set up a plastic throne with a plastic crown, there is one who sits on the throne of heaven with a crown of gold. And it is not me. There is one who is greater than I am. And when everything around is chaos, when everything around is frightening and filled with destruction and distress, it's him who sits on the throne that I can come to and worship. 
Because it's in his mercy, his kindness, his love that he calls me into relationship with him. So there's my hope. That even when the world seems to be falling apart, the world still belongs to God. And he still hears me when I pray. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for this passage, even though it's a difficult passage. It's a passage that speaks in an event that we will, we will never see. And yet points us forward to one that will come in the future. And yet even when distress is on its way, even when chaos is round the corner, even when destruction is on the horizon, you still tell us to pray. And Lord, we know that we are often those who do not pray. We often try and see if we can deal with the situation and use you as the last measure. Lord, help us to pray. We often look at prayer and think, what's the point? But God, help us to pray. We often look at the situations that we face around us. We look at the mess of the world and wonder what difference can we possibly hope to make. Lord God, help us to pray. And Lord, would you also remind us that the world belongs to you. That you are not only Father God who hears, you are creator God. Lord, remind us that you are not small but mighty. Remind us that you are all powerful. Remind us of who you are. So that even when the world seems to be falling apart, we would not because of whose we are and whom we trust in. So Lord God, whatever this week holds ahead, Whatever this week has in store for us, help us never to lose sight of you, but always to trust that the world belongs to you and we can still be a people of prayer. So Lord God, would you help us in all that we seek to do? It's in the beautiful name of Jesus I pray. Amen. In a moment we're going to sing of the one who sits on that throne. At the one who still reigns as we sing together, behold our God. But before we do, let me bless us all with these words. From the God most high, whose ways are mercy and truth, who leads us to his own heavenly throne, may he preserve our lives according to his promise. Keep each one of us from all harm and watch over our lives this day. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Tremble at his voice All creation rises to rejoice Behold our God Seated on his throne Come let us adore him Behold
Felt the nails upon his hand.